Welcome to Reefs and Reptiles. I'm your host, Charlie, and today I am joined by Tiffany, and we are going to talk about the lemon tetra. Lemon tetras are freshwater fish, and they are a very hardy fish, and a fish that I think would be good for a beginner or even someone that's seasoned with freshwater aquariums. So lemon tetras, scientific name, Hyphesobrycon Holcri penis. Not sure if I pronounced that correctly, but I'll give it a go there. Uh, they're found in South America uh, from the Amazon, um, specifically Brazil, and they sort of have a diamond shaped body. Um, they look a lot different than a neon tetra. So if you're thinking about a long, slender fish, that's not what lemon tetras are. Lemon tetras are a little bit bigger. They get to be about two inches long. They are, usually when you get them, they're silver, uh, but they do color up and they have a yellowish tinge, thus the name lemon tetra. They do have uh, black and yellow on their dorsal and anal fins. And we'll talk more about that later because that helps figure out who are the males and the females. But the black and yellow stands out. It looks really great. They also have a bright red uh, around their eye and the upper part of the eye. And that really stands out. Overall, they're a really active fish. Um, They're fun to watch. They will school when they're under stress. Um, But, you know, Typical, they kind of just spread out in the tank and, and do their own thing. Uh, we do have a group of lemon tetras in our in our own tank, and they really fill out the tank. They provide a lot to look at because they are the most active fish in the tank, and they uh, they look really cool. So, Tiffany, what do you think about the lemon tetras? What what's your vibe? What do you, what do you think about them in the tank? We have them. We do have lemon tetras. We yeah. have which tank? <laughs> this is the forty gallon with the the big one, the big tank, forty gallon breeder in the living room. Okay. And they're the yellowish, silverish guys at school. I'll have to go look. <laughs> All right. So they haven't made an impression on Tiffany, but <laughs> well, <that's> they've <laughs> made a big impression on me. <laughs> so, um. Started out with nine lemon tetras. And the reason I went with lemon tetras was because they are hardy. So I was starting out my first freshwater fish tank and I was very nervous about doing this because of pH. And the reason I was nervous about pH is because I have a saltwater background. That's what I've been doing since high school, keeping saltwater fish. And when you have saltwater fish, pH isn't really an issue because you're typically using crushed coral or some sort of live rock or base rock. And those calcium carbonate components uh, keep the pH fairly stable in a saltwater tank. They're, it's going to be between you know 8 and 8.4. Uh, depends on a lot of different things. But for the most part, the pH isn't an issue. Now, as I started reading more about freshwater fish, you come to find that in different river systems, different parts of the world, the pH in freshwater can vary quite a bit. And so knowing that these lemon tetras are from the Amazon, I knew that the pH was, you know, going to be lower because there's a lot of, uh, you know, leaf matter and, and plant matter that's decaying in this water. So it's, it's going to be soft. It's going to, you know, have a low pH. And so I was worried about what kind of fish, I could put into a tank with low pH and could I keep the pH low? The tap water that I have where I live is above seven coming out of the tap. So, 
you know, keeping it under seven was, was going to need some work. And I didn't, I didn't really understand if I needed to do that or not. So what I read about the lemon tetras is that they're fairly tolerant of different pH levels. Whereas as I read about neon tetras and cardinal tetras and some other tetras, they seem to be more sensitive to pH swings, which in hindsight isn't, I found that not to be as true as I, as I thought. I kind of scared myself out of just going right in with cardinal tetras, but um, ended up with, with lemons and so glad that I, I did get them. Uh, lemon tetras, you know, try to do a little research on how long they live. Uh, I saw generally the max is somewhere between six to eight years. Listen, um, captivity? Yeah, yeah, from, from what I could find online. So, you know, they're, they're fairly long-lived fish. Um, and what's interesting about them is once they're happy in the tank, they'll kind of spread out. And as they spread out, the males sort of have these little territories. And so, you know, one corner of the tank might be one male's territory, another corner might be another male's. And they'll sort of, they do like this little dance where they'll kind of, you know, square off with each other and they twist around in the tank they don't do any damage to each other. I mean, maybe every now and then one will nip the other one's fin and a fin might look a little raggedy, but they don't hurt each other in the sense that, you know, they're causing, uh, you know, wounds or anything like that. So, you know, they're, they're kind of jockeying for position and, uh, it, it does make, you know, very, a very interesting pet because they are very interactive. Can, can, do you know if you, or if there's male or females, or can you not tell? Yeah, so that's a that's a good question. So as they get older and they mature, the males on the anal fin have a really thick border of black on the anal fin. It's, it looks like someone took a black Sharpie and just outlined the fin uh, with a thick black felt pen. Now, the females also have black on the anal fin, but it's a thin line. It, it's not as thick. So if you see, you know, if you, when you're looking at the fins, you can kind of tell. And also the males, I'd say the dorsal fins, they kind of look a little bit higher. And the females, uh, you know, when they have eggs, they're going to look a little bit rounder, a little more plump. But so, there's no, nothing, like they're not twice the size like the females aren't twice the size. right no i mean for the most part they're pretty similar in size um and really it's those fins that at least from what i've noticed that you can really tell and then you'll also see like i said like the two males you'll, you'll see the males kind of bicker so with you each know other that the two that are fighting in our tank are males yes oh, okay right yeah and, and fighting you know because so i've seen fish fight and you know when fish fight Typically, it can get pretty ugly, but these guys are more just jockeying for position. They're they're establishing a hierarchy within their little group to figure out who's the top dog and who gets the best part of the tank and that kind of a mm-hmm. thing. So, does um, it matter like how high up in the tank they are, or just what spot of the tank? It's more about um, territory. It's more about spots, and it, and not just like where, but you know, maybe there might be a piece of driftwood or a rock or something that they really like or a plant even that they think, okay, this plant is the best place to lay eggs, you know, so I'm going to claim this plant kind of a thing. So I've noticed it seems to be driven by the, the hardscape and the plant life in the, in the tank. So uh, these guys were first introduced into the aquarium hobby in the 1930s. So they've been around forever. Uh, they are, um, captive bred now. So, you know, when you get them at the fish store, typically they're aquacultured, which is great. Is that what ours are? Yeah. And, um, you know, when you get an aquacultured fish, you're getting a fish that, you know, grows up in a certain, certain water parameters. A lot of fish are aquacultured, obviously overseas in Asia, but then also in Florida, that's another hot spot for aquaculture. And, You know, uh, I hear Corey at Aquarium Co-op talk about the kind of water, you know, that the fish are growing up in. And so, you know, the fish in Florida are growing up under certain water parameters. And so, you know, they're sort of used to a higher pH than if they were taken right out of the Amazon, right? 
So that, that helps us as fish keepers because we're getting a fish that's sort of been, you know, it's been brought up in conditions that are uh, going to be more similar to what we have at home. Now, obviously, across the United States, there's all different kinds of tap water with, you know, different minerals, different pH levels, uh, chlorine, chloramine, all that stuff. So you do need to know a little bit about your water before you get any fish. And especially if you're planning out a tank, and I would say especially a freshwater tank, you really need to see what pH levels certain fish are comfortable with. For instance, a lot of African cichlids like really high pH. They like, you know, way up there. And so they're not going to mix well with a uh, uh, South American cichlid that would prefer a low pH. So you kind of want to group certain fish. As an example, I have a pond that has guppies who like high mineral, high pH. And um, in that tank as well is a beta. He's, he's you know, happy in that tank. Um, and, you know, they all, they all do really well. And also there is a ranchu goldfish. And goldfish seem to like uh, harder water. They like more minerals in the water. And so they get along great. And then this other tank that I'm talking about with the lemon tetras is for fish that, you know, would prefer a, a more neutral pH, closer to seven, or maybe even a little bit acidic. So something to keep in mind. Um, one thing that I really love about lemon tetras is that they are easy to breed. Now, how do I know they're easy to breed? Well, I've bred them and I've bred them without even trying. I was under the impression that for me to breed tetras, I was going to have to uh, get a pair, a uh, male and a female, and move them to a different tank and maybe use rainwater and lower the pH and create a situation where the eggs could uh, scatter so that the parents couldn't eat them. Basically, I thought it was going to be a production. And I was, you know, excited about trying that out, but, you know, hadn't gotten around to it yet. And then lo and behold, one day I'm looking in the tank and there is the teeniest, tiniest little, little lemon tetra fry swimming around in my tank and I couldn't believe it. So, you know, once I saw the first fry, I got super excited and was thinking, okay, how did this happen? Well, let me back up a step and, and try to you know, go through some of the things that, that I did that I think uh, allowed this breeding to happen and for the fry to make it. So when I first got these lemon tetras, I had a 20 gallon long tank. And I, like I said, I got nine. Um, the reason I got nine is because lemon tetras like to school and, you know, Corey and some other fish guys on online say, you know, you should have at least six lemon tetras so that they feel comfortable together. But the more the merrier, as long as you have a big enough tank uh, to accommodate them. And I found that in the 20 gallon long, they did well, right? Everybody was eating well, everybody seemed happy. But it did seem a little cramped as far as the males establishing territory, they were sort of on top of each other. Now, in that 20 long, I would say after having them two or three months, they started breeding. And one morning, I was walking by the tank, noticed these fish were, these two lemon tetras were just kind of shimmying. They were like rubbing up against each other. And they were in the Pogo Stimon Stellatus octopus, which is a plant, if you guys know what that is. If not, go to aquariumcoop.com look up the plants that they sell. One of them is the Pogo Stemon Stellatus octopus. It's a stem plant, really cool plant. It grew like a weed in my 20 gallon. And they were in, in the midst of that and they were you know doing their courtship dance and the female would release the eggs and the male was fertilizing them. Now in that 20 long, none of the eggs, uh, you know, none of the fry I should say survived. And I was trying to think of why that is. Now, in a tank like that, the lemon tetras are, are scatter egg layers, right? So they're just going to release their eggs. And typically, they'd be in like a stream or a river, and those eggs are going to disperse. In a tank, the eggs just fall straight down, and um, fish are going to eat those eggs. So if the eggs don't have 
you know, a way to get away from predation, basically the eggs become food. And I think in the 20 gallon, that's what happened. I was using fluval stratum as my... What is that? Okay, good question. So fluval stratum was the substrate. And it's a substrate that is specialized for plant growth. So I was using that and... and like an instrument. All right. <laughs> so, so anyway, fluval stratum. And um, fluval stratum, it looks like a lot of little BBs, like little black BBs, right? And it's volcanic and uh, comes from some mountain in Japan, apparently, some oh, volcano. It's from a volcano? Yeah. Do we have it here in Hawaii? Well, it's, they don't use the volcanic soil here in Hawaii to make it. Apparently, they use volcanic soil in um, Japan to make it. And I've been experimenting with different soils here in Hawaii to see if I could find something free, like mm -hmm. literally hanging around here, that might do the same thing. So far, I haven't figured that out yet, but I'm working on it. But anyway, fluval stratum, which I, I would recommend. I mean, I... Um, you know, that this was again, this was my first freshwater tank, and I was thinking, okay, I really want, uh, I was really focusing on plant growth more so than the fish, really. Like, I was really excited about having a lot of plants and getting that going. So, but the fluval stratum, because it's these little BBs and they pack in, you know, pretty tightly, there wasn't really space for the eggs to fall into the gravel, right? And that's important. Because I think the eggs didn't, you know, and, and if they did, maybe there wasn't enough room for them to nestle in. But point being is never saw any fry in the 20-gallon. So had the 20-gallon running, let's see, oh, about five or six months and then um, upgraded to a 40 breeder. And when I, I, I basically took everything out of this 20-gallon and put it into the 40 breeder. And when I did that, what was uh, one thing I changed was I bought pea gravel at Lowe's, right? So I got a bag of pea gravel. Pea gravel? Pea gravel. And they call it pea gravel because the gravel is like the size of a pea, but it's oh. actually bigger than a pea. It's not made out of peas. <laughs> not made out of peas. Um, but pea gravel. And if you go to Lowe's, you can get a bag of pea gravel. It's way cheaper than showing up at Petco or PetSmart and trying to buy gravel. Um, you get more for your money. So, you know, clean the pea gravel in some buckets, you know, because it's very dirty when you buy it at Lowe's because people are assuming you're using it for a walkway or something, so they don't rinse it at all. So anyway, make sure you clean it before you use it. But um, I put the fluval stratum layer down first in the 40 breeder. Same stuff from the 20 long. Then on top of it, I used pea gravel. And I did that because I wanted to build up the um, gravel base for the 40 breeder because I wanted to create that look where, you know, the front of the tank is not much gravel and then the back is built up to create depth and, you know, I'm trying to be a better aquascaper in that way. So now the pea gravel has, creates these nooks and crannies, right? Because it's big enough, they're big enough pieces of stone that, you know, certainly this teeny tiny little egg, and we're talking about hundreds of eggs, right, when they lay, when they disperse their eggs, could fall in the cracks of, of this pea gravel. And I think changing to that gravel is what allowed the fry in the egg to get through that egg stage and uh, hatch. And then, you know, I think they live off their yolk sac for a little while. And then the next stage is for them to start eating, you know, microorganisms. Now, um, infusoria, right, is a food for uh, fish fry that you can make at home. And that's, you know, sort of another topic for another day. Uh, Google infusoria if you want to know more about it. Um, but basically, it's like you're, you're culturing bacteria and stuff um, for fish to, fish to eat, munch on. Now, all aquariums have these, you know, microorganisms growing on driftwood, rocks, whatever you got in your tank, plants. And so, you know, what I'm guessing is because the tank had been, you know, established for, you know, at least six to eight months, it had enough microorganisms so that when 
the, the, you know, out of maybe hundreds of eggs, I had one or two fry. Well, this one fry show up, right? So he made it through the gauntlet. Wait, just one? Just, well, just one at first. Now there were more and we'll talk about that in a minute, but, but one fry made it. Now this tank, just so that you have a, and maybe um, once I get the website going, I'll post some pictures of what this tank looks like and a picture of the fry, because I did get a picture of the fry. Um, but this tank is, you know, it's got a lot going on. There's a big pre- piece of, of wood going diagonally in the tank. There's a couple pieces of lava rock in the tank. There, It's, you know, fairly heavily planted. There's some some good cover there for them. But I think one of the, one of the things that I think really... Um, made this work is I got some Java moss, right? And the way aquarium co-op uh, sells Java moss is you get it and it's on like a metal, what do you, what, how would you, it's like a metal grid or something. It's kind of like, it almost feels like aluminum, like an aluminum metal uh, net almost. But anyway, um, the Java moss is attached to that and you can bend this metal. So you could like put it on top of a piece of wood and wrap it around the wood. Um, or you could put it on a rock and kind of shape it on the rock. But the idea is the moss is attached to this uh, metal to give it some structure. So it doesn't just start floating off into little bits. So I put, initially I had this moss at the top of a piece of driftwood and that was a bad idea because it got way too much light and I got a lot of hair algae growing in the moss and it just looked it looked bad because it was covered in hair algae. And so then I took the java moss and I put it at the back of the aquarium, kind of at the base of the driftwood, and I just flattened it out. And it was over a piece of chola wood. Um, chola or chala, not really sure how to pronounce that. But anyway, small little piece of wood. And I think that, and I don't know this for sure, but I'm pretty sure that that's where the lemon tetras were trying to lay their eggs, right? Because I, I know they like to lay it in plant matter. And if some of that, if some of those eggs fell into the moss and then went into the wood and then went into the gravel, I could see that being an effective barrier to the adult lemon tetras and the other fish that were in the tank from getting to the eggs. And I think that's what allowed the egg to survive. And then, like I said, I think there was enough uh, microorganisms um, in there so that one fry survived. So the first fry showed up, he hung out for a couple weeks, then another fry showed up, then another fry showed up, and then at like maybe a month later, a fourth fry. So we went from nine to 13. And since then I removed that java moss in part because it just was so overrun with hair algae, it was starting to grow onto other things that I didn't want it to get on. And I took the java moss out. And ever since I took that java moss out of that spot, I've noticed I haven't gotten any more fry. So again, I think there's something to that, to having that java moss as a place where they could lay their eggs. And so I've got, you know, four babies, haven't done anything, haven't specifically fed them, haven't, you know, again, besides putting the java moss in the tank, haven't done anything. And I never did I think that something would survive. Now, I also have neon tetras in this tank and have never seen a neon tetra fry. So maybe their fry are too small to make it through. Maybe because the lemon tetras are a little bit bigger, their fry are a little bit hardier. When the fry use up the, the egg yolk, maybe they're just big enough that they're able to munch on stuff that's in the tank. I don't know. But the point is, is that if yeah, you're... Have you seen them eat the yolk? Or you just read that they do that? Well, they don't like, they absorb it, right? So it's, oh. you know, it's like attached to them and, and, and their bodies just kind of absorb it. And then when it's all used up, it's time for them to start eating. You know, it's, and, and even when they have it, they'll still, you know, you know once they're swimming Did around. Did you see it on them? No. See, that's the thing. I didn't see a baby lemon tetra or fry until it was pretty well developed. I mean, it was, you know... I'm trying to see how big it was. It was like, you know, as big as bigger than an eraser on a pencil. So, you know, it had obviously been living for a while before I was able to see it. And, 
there's this cool spot between the driftwood and the lava rock that I don't think a lot of fish could get into. And I think that crack is where he was living. Mm -hmm. So I think he, you know, he found a spot in the tank where bigger fish, because there, let me give you a rundown. There is a male beta, blue, navy blue kind of beta in the tank. Lemon tetras, neon tetras, pygmy corridoras, uh, a honey sunset garami. Um, and there are bristle nose plecos now, but they weren't really in there back then. So, you know, those are kind of the, the guys. And like I said, the parents will eat the eggs. Um, what was interesting about when this fry showed up, you know, immediately, um, once I saw him, I had some really uh, small food. I had, um, uh, Sarah, I think the company is Sarah, it's S E R A. And it was like fry food. Right. And then I got some aquarium co-op fry food. And so I started putting that into the tank and letting it drift down and turning the pumps off so that it would get down to where he was. And I saw him start to eat it. So, you know, once I knew he was in there and then also the other thing was I started hatching baby brine shrimp, which they love. And what's really cool about baby brine shrimp is the adult lemon tetras and neon tetras. They all love it too. They'll eat, even though it's really small compared to them, they'll go nuts for it. And it, you know, it's, they're actively hunting these brine shrimp, but the babies, it's perfect for them. And they'll just munch on it. And it's cool because uh, their bellies start to turn orange. So you can, you can tell that they've gotten a good meal and that they're really putting on the pounds and, and they've grown, you know, I mean, in a month's time, you know, they, they start to look like their parents and they start to get their color. They get the yellow, they get the black. So it's been, it's been super exciting to, to see these guys and watch them grow up. So, yeah, I mean, the eggs, j just some stats, the eggs, once they're laid or scattered, they take about 72 hours to hatch. The females can produce 300 eggs. So, you know, if you were to... 300 eggs and we only got one. Well, see, and, and that's what's kind of kind of cool is that, you know, that's how it works in the wild. You know, like most of the babies don't make it. Um, and even, I guess, you know, these guys in the wild would be in like a school of like 500 or 1,000. There's just tons of them. And the parents will start eating other eggs because they don't want the other parents' eggs to, you know, grow up. They want their babies to live. So it's just interesting. They're all competing. Um, but I don't know if they're smart enough to know whose egg is whose. I think they're just <laughs> going after whatever they see in the water column. Um, but yeah, so, you know, you could, you could get a ton of babies if you removed, if you removed the parents, put them in a breeding tank, had them lay the eggs, fertilize the eggs, then take the parents out of that tank and let the eggs, you know, do their thing. And if you had uh, infusoria culture to feed those fry, then, you know, in theory, you could have a ton of lemon tetras. Um, and, you know, look, they're not going to cost, it's not something that's going to make anybody rich, right? Because they don't cost a lot at the fish store. But as far as, you know, having a great, fish and an interesting fish um i don't i don't know if there's a better one out there to be honest with you i've just and i i really like their shape you know I, they're they're not too big where they take up too much of the tank and they're not too small where you know they're not showy because they are um and they remind me of a saltwater permit if you know what a permit looks like uh it's a fish that a lot of people go fishing and try to catch uh, in florida and stuff um, but they have that really that cool shape. What? Are the permit fish, are those the white? Are they white? Yeah. I mean, they're kind of silvery, oh. can be whitish, but they're kind of diamond shaped. And they're fast. Um, so, so yeah. Yeah, they're um, salt water, right? Yeah, they are. They come up, they kind of come up close to the shore. Right. Yeah. The babies do. Yeah. yeah. So. I think we saw them in Turks and Caicos. We saw a whole bunch. Yes. Yes, you are right about that. So, you know, I like I like these lemon tetras because they, like I said, they kind of remind me of them, but they're on a much more manageable <laughs> level. Um, so what else? So obviously they like plants. You know, if you're going to keep 
Lemon Tetras, I would say start a planted aquarium. Um, and I've mentioned uh, Aquarium Co-op a few times now. Uh, Corey and his team over there do an excellent job of putting out YouTube videos. And Corey's got his own podcast. Um, and we are not sponsored by anybody. <laughs> yeah, we're not sponsored, we're not. but I'm a big fan. So I'm, I'm just going to throw out there our, that... Our suggestions. Yeah, like as I, was, as I was trying to learn how to do a freshwater tank, I knew I wanted it to be planted. I knew I wanted it because, because I was coming from a saltwater reef situation. And what's interesting about that is, you know, when I started with saltwater, I was all about the fish. I could care less about rocks. I could care less about coral. Couldn't I care less. Couldn't care less. <laughs> um, but, you know, as I, you know, was researching freshwater and I guess that might be a good point. Why, why am I doing a freshwater tank? Well, here in Hawaii, where I live, uh, doing a saltwater tank is actually kind of difficult because there's tons of rules and regulations about what you could keep, you know, what, what you could go to the ocean and get and keep. And at the, um, at the fish stores here, they, they have a very limited selection. They don't have coral at the fish stores here. Uh, because Hawaii has a lot of endemic uh, species, and they have they they have a really fragile environment. So they're they don't want somebody to go buy a bubble tip anemone at the store, get tired of it, and release it out on the reef here. And so to protect themselves from that, uh, they don't allow people to buy invertebrates and corals and and things like that. Now they do have fish at the fish store that are saltwater that aren't from around here. You'll see Caribbean species and other, and I guess they're just hoping that, you know, most folks aren't going to get tired of it and just throw it in the ocean because obviously that would be a bad thing. So, so that's interesting. Um, but it does, it, you know, when I, when I first got here, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to have the most amazing saltwater tank. This is going to be amazing. I can just, you know, I can, you know, get crabs and all kinds of cool things and, and really uh, make this tank amazing. And the reality is, is you know, you can do it. And I'm sure there's folks here in Hawaii that are doing it and have an amazing tank. But, you know, I just, I kind of thought, well, a lot of folks here um, are doing freshwater. And, you know, 90, 95% of what you see at the pet stores here is freshwater. Uh, very little salt water. So I, you know, I thought, okay, you know, let's, this is kind of a new challenge, even though I would say most folks start with freshwater and work their way up to saltwater. I did it the opposite way. And I have reasons for that. And there'll be episodes about why that is the case. But, um, but yeah, so that's why I'm doing, you know, a freshwater tank here in Hawaii. And, uh, you know, it's been, it's been awesome. Like I, I really love it. And I, I never look, the key, one of the keys, right, to keeping any kind of aquatic life going is water changes. Because out in the ocean, right, it's the ocean, right? It's like the ultimate water change. There's so much volume. And then, you know, talking about the Amazon, you're talking about river systems. That's a con it's one big water change, right? There's rain coming down, fresh water getting pumped into the system. The water's flowing out through into the oceans, so it's all about water changes and fresh water, right? I just, you know, I've been mixing salt water for so long. I never really realized how, how much of a chore that was. And it has been kind of a weird, it's almost too easy. It's like, okay, I can take the water out of my tap, fill it in a bucket, put some dechlorinator in it and call it good. Like that's all I got to do to it. Because before I was all about reverse osmosis and I was purifying water because I didn't want phosphates and I didn't want nitrates in the water and I didn't want to get, you know, because I was doing coral, right? I wanted the water to be as pure as possible so that my coral would thrive and I wouldn't get algae problems in my tank. And so this has just been kind of neat because it, it makes the, it makes it so much more accessible to do a water change. And, you know, with salt water, you're buying salt you know you're buying buckets of salt that can get expensive now obviously here in hawaii i can go down to the beach and i can just get a bucket of salt or excuse me salt water i should say you know dip dip a bucket in the ocean and 
I can do it that way. Um, but you know, you're limited. And you do. And I do. <laughs> but you're limited by, you know, how many buckets are you going to haul? And um, interesting side note about the salt water here where I live is that the salinity uh, fluctuates wildly because there's fresh water uh, near the shore and it's being, it's underground, it's under the volcanoes and everything and it's getting pumped out near the shoreline. So sometimes I'll go to get um, ocean water and the salinity is brackish at best. So that's been interesting because you just kind of, I took for granted that you know, if I dipped my bucket in the ocean, I was going to get salt water and uh, hasn't really been the case. So, and that also has been interesting because of the organisms that have adapted to live in those, uh, you know, lower salinities uh, here in Hawaii. So that's, so that's cool. But let's get back to lemon tetras. So my lemon tetras, they will eat a, a, a very diet that, I love watching them eat because they're real boisterous about it. I won't say aggressive because they're not like, they're not going after anybody. They're just, they're darting at the surface. Like sharks. Yeah, they, they are. They're like little sharks, but in a good way, not in a bad, I'm going to kill everybody else way. Um, and they love Hikari micro pellets. There's a, Hikari makes this micro pellet and there's a, neon tetra a picture of a neon tetra on the front and some other fish and they just and they're kind of reddish colored pellets and they love those um that that is definitely their favorite food when i put it in there uh, well maybe their favorite food's the baby brine shrimp they really like brine shrimp they go nuts for that too but as far as dry food goes they really like that they'll eat flake food but a lot of times they'll kind of taste it and spit it out taste it and spit it out that kind of thing so i can tell they're not super excited about it um, I've, I have some plecos in the tank, so I'll throw in these sinking wafers and, uh, these other sinking, uh, tablet foods and they'll attack it on its way down. Like they'll munch on it. And if, if it does get to the bottom and it starts to dissolve and break apart, they'll pick at it, you know? So they'll, they'll actively eat at the top and they'll actively eat at the bottom and everywhere in between. So, like I said, they're just, they're really uh, hearty, fun fish to feed. Y- you never have to worry like, oh, this one's not eating. I've never, never had an issue where I've said, oh, this one's not feeling well. He's not eating today. I mean, they just, they always go for it. Um, now, another thing about um, baby brine, and I've heard Corey and Dean, if, if you guys watch the aquarium co-op stuff, you know who Dean is. He's a master breeder. Um, and they talk about how, Well, Dean, I think the theory is, is that if you put baby brine shrimp live, baby brine shrimp in the water column, the parent fish think, okay, there's, there's a food source for my baby fish, so we should breed. And, you know, I don't know if that's true of lemon tetras, but they were talking about that with some other fish. Maybe some smarter fish might think that. I don't know, but, um, it is interesting and I have been feeding more, live baby brine shrimp and uh i've noticed the color of the fish has gotten better since i've done that so that's another thing um we have pea puffers and because we have pea puffers i started buying blood worms and so when the pea puffers were done um eating the blood worms if we had leftovers i started putting some of the leftover blood worms into the lemon tetra tank and they really love bloodworms. So that's another food that you can, you know, put on the list. Um, I also feed them bug bites, which I think Fluval makes bud, bug bites, but it, it's really convenient because it's like a little bottle and you flip the cap open and you just kind of shake. It's kind of like you just shake a few uh, bug bite that, you know, kind of spreads out. Some are big, not big chunks, but they're all little, but there's different size granules. And so, um, they really like that too. So again, as far as food goes, they'll eat just about anything. And the other thing that's really cool is that at night, if we do get some uh, flying bugs in our house and they're attracted to the aquarium lights, if they land on the surface, you can see the lemon tetris shoot up to the top and take some of these bugs off the surface. And I, I really like that. I think that's really cool because they're getting a natural food. They're getting a bug and you know, who knows what the bug's been eating that day, but 
it, it's really cool because it's got to be really good nutrition for them and it's fun to watch. So, you know, anyway, that's something to keep out for. Um, so yeah, as far as their temperament, uh, you know, they're boisterous, right? Like they, they get in the thick of it, especially when you feed them, but they're not aggressive. Um, again, I've got Corydoras, Plecos, Neon Tetras, Honey Garami, and a Beta, or Beta, I don't know how to say it, Beta, I guess, but they don't, you know, they don't do anything to those guys. They're totally cool. Like never seen a weird interaction or seen somebody chase somebody else of a different species. The lemon tetras really just bicker amongst themselves, which, you know, is interesting to watch in its own way. So, um, they make a good community fish. Um, I mentioned that they do school, but I really only see them school if, if they get freaked out. So like when I change the tank from the 20 gallon to the 40 gallon, they schooled up really tight because they were like, what's going on? This is insane. We're all going to die. You know, they were freaking <laughs> out and they were, they were schooling really tight. And then once they got used to the tank, they don't school. I mean, it is cool. They will kind of come together, you know, at certain times and you, and you see them hanging out. And, and the way I set up my tank is um, I have an AquaClear 70 on one side of the tank. Oh, I don't know what that is. Uh, that's a, it's the hang on filter that hangs on the side of the tank. Instead of putting it on the back of the tank, I put it on the side because I feel like you get more water flow and it creates this gyre effect because the water is flowing across the top back part of the tank from one end to the other. And then it loops back around and comes back. So the front of the tank, the water is flowing from right to left and they'll face that way and swim against that current which is really cool so um and i guess i'll talk about that more maybe in another episode is how i set that up but i think i just think it's better i think if you put the the hang on back at the back of the tank you're sort of creating these two gyres because you're pushing water towards the front and i don't know i just i don't like that water flow as much um I think it's more efficient to put it on the side if, you know, if setting it up that way still looks good for, you know, what you got going on. Um, so let's see that the tank parameters, I want to talk about that a little bit. So, you know, last time I did a water test and I use those easy test strips. I don't, I'm not doing the whole titration thing that that's, to me that I agree with Corey, like that's a waste of time. Like, I mean, it it has its place. If things are really going high wire and you don't know what's wrong with your water, then yeah, that's good. But the ease at which you can stick one of these test strips in and just see, get a general idea where things are. That's, that's the way to go. So nitrate right now is at 20 parts per million. Uh, and nitrite is at zero. You don't want to have nitrite if you're new to the, freshwater fish game and the saltwater game you don't want nitrite at all nitrate the plants are going to use as a food source so having some nitrate is good um and at 20 parts per million even at 40 they don't i haven't noticed the lemon tetras caring you know i haven't gone over that and if i did you know i might have some feedback on that but you know as long as you're keeping around 20 parts per million i think you're good um the hardness of the water uh, is 150 parts per million. And the water out here is, you know, moderately hard, I'd say. Um, so I think that's good for the plants and it doesn't seem to bother the tetras. Now, certain Amazonian fish aren't going to like minerals in the water, so they don't want it to be hard at all. So, you know, that, again, that's something to be aware of is you, you should know that. And, uh, but, but again, these lemon tetras, and maybe part of that's because they're aquacultured, uh, but they seem to be fine with some minerals in the water. Um, as far as the alkalinity goes, um, I'm at 40 parts per million. And that, um, you know, that, that again, that seems to be fine. The, the higher that is, the more buffering capacity you have for pH. You know, you don't want it to be super low. Um, but again, around 40, they seem to be happy. And the pH right now is, is 7.2. So we're pretty close to neutral. And these guys are doing, are doing really well. Um, so yeah, I mean, let's see what other topics did I want to talk about? You know, I, I think, I think I've covered it all. 
overall, I think lemon tetras are a fantastic fish. I know who you're talking about now. Oh, you figured it out. Well, I thought they were silver, I guess. I didn't realize that they were yellow. Yeah, so they, they are, when I first got them, they were silver. Okay, that's probably the last time I looked at them. Well, okay, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> but yeah, they are. They do start out silver. And as they get more comfortable, as they get bigger, and you feed them right, uh, they, they get that yellowish hue to them. And, uh, and, and again, I just, I think they're absolutely great. I think they should be at the top of the list of a lot of people's, uh, tanks uh, because again, they're not, they're not too big and they're not too small. They're, they're kind of just right. Especially when you're, you know, like I said, they're in a 40 breeder and, uh, I have 13 of them right now and it seems to be, you know, pretty, I mean, I, I could have more in that tank and I think everything would be fine. Um, but for the size of that tank and for the size of the fish, it just seems like a good happy medium. Uh, you know, obviously if you had a 75 gallon or 120 or something like that, you know, you could probably go nuts and get a ton of them. Um, and they, they probably do really well. Um, but yeah, I just, I think for, you know, most, I don't, I don't think most folks are going out there and getting those huge tanks. So if, if you're like me and you're, going to Petco and you're buying a 29 gallon or a 40 gallon or something in that range, these fish will work out in that size tank. Um, I think the 40 breeder is the way to go because they like, they like that swimming room, I think. So I think that's a good way to go. Um, you know, if I had to give it a score out of 10, I would give, you know, I'd give these guys a Charlie score of a 10 out of 10. I, I really can't think of anything uh, bad about them. Um, never gotten sick. Uh, never missed a day of work. I mean, they just, they just keep on ticking. And, uh, you know, certainly when I started out my tanks, they weren't spot on cause I was learning as I was going. And, and like I said, like they've just been real troopers. So highly recommend the lemon tetra. And, uh, like I said, once we get the website going, I'm going to try to post some pictures of the lemon tetras uh, that I have and, and maybe share some, some thoughts I have on keeping them. Um, but, but that's about it. Tiffany, you got any last thoughts on the lemon tetras? <laughs> now that you know that what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. No, I, but I was going to say, um, that we do need to make sure that they can't hear our dog in the background. <laughs> no, they can't. So our, our Cleo dog is shaking, <laughs> shaking her head around. Uh, yeah, our, <laughs> our dog Cleo, I think wants to go out. So she's, <laughs> She's been nudging me here at the desk. So so we're going to wrap it up there so we can let Cleo go out because she's ready to roll. And uh, anyway, thanks for joining us, everybody, on Reefs and Reptiles. Um, look forward to speaking with you all next time. And I hope you're all's reptiles and reef tanks and planted tanks are all doing great. Thanks so much. Bye. <laughs>